Okay. So, we will discuss the case of BCL3. BCL3 is a molecule which has nice shape. The three chlorines are sitting at the three corners of an equilateral triangle and uh, uh, the electron configuration of uh, boron is actually 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. And in order to explain the formation of a uh, of a triangular molecule with all the three bonds being equivalent. What we have to do is we have to imagine that one electron is promoted from here and put into the next 2 p orbital. So, let me call this 2 p x this one I will call 2 p y and that also has one electron and then these three orbitals will mix together that means they will hybridize together and will give me three new orbitals three new hybrid orbitals the first one I will call phi 1, the second one will be phi 2 and the third one is phi 3. So, because you see the orbitals involved are 2 p x and 2 p y I will say that okay, the x y plane is the plane of the molecule. So, this is my y axis and that is my x axis let us say this is convenient and phi 1 is actually going to be written as a linear combination of uh, these three orbitals we do not worry about 1 s we worry only about these three. So, I am going to have 2 s plus b 1 2 p x plus c 1 2 p y. Similarly, phi 2 will be a 2 2 s plus B 2 2 p x plus C 2 2 p y and the third is going to be A 3 2 s plus B 3 2 p x plus C 3 2 p y and of course, what do we want to do? We want all these orbitals to be normalized. Not only should they be normalized, they should all be orthogonal to one another, right. And so, using these conditions and some physical arguments, we will determine all these coefficients a 1, a 2, a 3, b 1, b 2, b 3, and so on. Straight away, I can make a simplification here because the way I have chosen the geometry, right. This B C L bond is along the x axis. Let me say that phi 1 is the hybrid orbital which is used to form that bond. Then what will happen? It would have contribution only from 2 p x. This is only simplifying things so that we can easily calculate. So, this bond will involve a hybrid orbital involving only the 2 s and the 2 p x. It will not involve the hybrid, it will, it will not involve 2 p y. So, therefore, immediately I can say that okay, C 1 must be 0. So, it is convenient because I am getting rid of one of the unknowns by this simple physical argument. And then if that is the way it is, uh, phi 1 is normalized which implies that integral of phi 1 square d 2 over the entire space. We have calculated this kind of integral in the previous lecture. You will take the square of this integrate and put it equal to 1. Uh, if you did that, you remember that 2 s is normalized, 2 p x is normalized, they are orthogonal to one another. So, effectively you will get a 1 square plus b 1 square equal to 1. And as I told you earlier, a 1 square is the contribution of 2 s, a 1 square determines the contribution of 2 s to this atomic orbital phi 1, b 1 square determines the contribution of 2 p x to that hybrid orbital a 1 square determines the contribution of 2 s to the hybrid orbital phi 1 and b 1 square determines the contribution of 2 p x to the hybrid orbital phi 1. Okay. Similarly, if you integrated phi 2 square d 2 you are going to get a similar equation that is going to be a 2 square plus p 2 square plus c 2 square and this should be equal to 1 
integral of phi 3 square d 2 ohm must be a 3 square plus b 3 square plus c 3 square, right. Now, all the orbitals I want them to be equivalent. So, if they are all to be equivalent, what does that mean? It means that a 1 square, a 2 square, a 3 square should have the same value. Otherwise, the 1 orbital will have more, more contribution from the s orbital. So, I have this condition that a 1 square must be equal to a 2 square plus which is equal to a 3 square. And further, if I added all these things up, see this is the contribution that s orbit 2 s makes to first hybrid, second hybrid and third hybrid. I have only one s orbital. So, if I added all of them up, if I added a 1 square plus a 2 square plus a 3 square, the answer must be 1 because it is only one s orbital. So, I arrive at the conclusion that a 1 square plus a 2 square plus a 3 square must be equal to 1 and these two together immediately tells me that 3 a 1 square must be equal to 1 implying that a 1 can be taken to be 1 by square root of 3. Correct. So, if we chose a 1 to be 1 by square root of 3, I can put this 1 by square root of 3 here and then of course, I can choose a 2. See a 2 square is actually equal to a 1 square. So, I can choose a 2 to also to be equal to 1 by square root of 3, a 3 also to be equal to 1 by square root of 3. So, therefore, I have determined all these 3 numbers. Okay, now, what do I have? I have to determine b 1 that will be my next aim, but I know that in the, I have this equation. In this equation a 1 is 1 by square root of 3 that implies this equation means b 1 square must be equal to how much? This is a 1 is 1 by square root of 3 that means b 1 square must be equal to 2 by 3 or b 1 must be equal to square root of 2 by 3. So, I have determined that and I get this square root of 2 by 3. Fine. And now, I would like to determine b 2. How will I determine b 2? The answer is I impose the condition that phi 1 and phi 2 have to be orthogonal. So, if you multiply phi 1 with phi 2, again strictly speaking phi 1 star with phi 2, but star has no effect because everything is real. What is it that you are going to get? You have to multiply these two. Just for the sake of illustration, let me do this multiplication. this must be equal to 0. And what does that mean? It means the following. See, if you multiplied this 1 by square root of 3 2 years into that, you are going to get 1 by 3 integral of 2 years square d 2. So, this will be just one of the terms and this I know is 1 because the 2 years is normalized. And if you multiply 2 s with 2 p x and integrate over the entire space, you are going to get a 0. So, I am not going to write it down. And if you multiply this with that again, it is going to be 0. So, therefore, to this term into any of these terms, what will happen? Only this term with 2 s will survive and the other terms vanish. Similarly, this, this term, if you multiply it with 2 s, the answer is going and integrated over the entire space, answer will be 0. 
multiply this with that what will be the answer it is going to be root 2 by 3 into b 2 right because 2 p x into 2 p x so in square integrated over the entire space is 1 and this into that integrated over the entire space will be 0. So, therefore, this is actually equal to 0 fine and hence I can now find uh, b 2 this is uh, this object is 1 this is 1. So, what do you find for b 2? b 2 will be equal to minus 1 by 3 into square root of 3 by 2 which is actually equal to minus 1 by root 6. right and hence I will now substitute for b 2 this is actually minus 1 by root 6. Now, this last orbital also should be orthogonal to this correct and that implies that this b 3 also must be equal to the same number because you can proceed in exactly the same fashion you will find that this must be equal to minus 1 by root 6. So, we are left with the job of determining C 2 and C 3. So, how will you determine that the answer is very simple you will use this equation a 2 we know how much it is a 2 is 1 by root 3 b 2 is minus 1 by root 6. correct. So, what will happen you are going to get 1 by 3 plus 1 by 6 plus c 2 square is equal to 1 which means c 2 square is actually 1 minus 1 by 3 minus 1 by 6 if you calculated this this is actually 6 into sorry uh, 6 minus 2 minus 1 divided by 6 and how much is that it is half. So, c 2 square you find it is equal to half correct and therefore, what is what can you use for c 2 c 2 you can say it is 1 by square root of 2 fine. So, this we have determined c 2 will be 1 by square root of 2 what about C 3? Well, it cannot be the same because then these two orbitals will be identical, but then when you look at this what you what is it that you find C 2 all that this equation says is that C 2 must be equal to 1 by 2. So, therefore, if the square is equal to 1 by 2 I have another possible solution and that will be minus 1 by root 2 and that is the one that I should choose and therefore, this is going to be equal to minus 1 by root 2 why because you see otherwise the two orbitals have will be identical fine and then you can actually verify this orbital into that orbital you can calculate the overlap and find that it is 0. Similarly, all these orbitals are, are orthogonal to one another each one of them is normalized right. So, having constructed these orbitals I want to look at their shapes. So, this is my 2 p x it is my 2 p y and of course, if you try to represent 2 s also in the same picture the picture will become somewhat complex okay. and this is how it appears.
okay but to have the same the to sorry to have the first hybrid orbital what should i do i have to take 2s multiplied by square root of 2 by 3 I'm saying things wrong i take 2s multiplied by 1 by square root of 3 add to it 2px multiplied by square root of 2 by 3 if you did that see what you are doing is you are taking 2s this is 2px and you multiply this by square root of 2 by 3 and that by 1 by square root of 3 add the 2 up what is the result the result is simple you will get a hybrid orbital which actually points in the x direction this lobe will be positive that lobe will be negative and if you took Two s multiplied by one by square root of three, two p x you multiply by minus one by root six. Okay, that means you are actually multiplying two p x with a minus sign. So therefore, it is actually making it to point in the opposite direction. It tends to point in the opposite direction. But then you are also adding two p y. So therefore, the that contribution actually would like to make the orbital point in this direction, in the y direction. So therefore, what will happen? You have two contributions. One would like to point it in the negative x direction. The other will like to point it in the y direction. So the net direction in which the orbital points is is neither in the x direction nor in the y direction, but somewhere in between. It will point in such a direction, such that this angle is 120 degrees. Okay, and the last orbital will naturally point in a different direction. It will actually point in such a direction such that this angle is 120 degrees. So this is phi 2, and that is phi 3. This lobe is positive. Uh, that is negative. This one is positive. This is negative, and I have done the same kind of thing here. So these are the three hybrid orbitals. What you find is that the three hybrid orbitals are actually pointing towards the three corners of an equilateral triangle. And these hybrid orbitals are then used to form bonds with the three chlorines. And naturally what will happen, the three chlorines will be located at the corners of an equilateral triangle, thus explaining the geometry. And not only the geometry, the hybrid orbitals are all equivalent and therefore the bonds all have the same strength. I have a uh, Mathematica file showing these orbitals. So this is actually what I refer to as a contour plot of the first hybrid orbital phi 1 and notice that it is actually pointing in the x direction right in the x direction x is marked correctly at least in this picture. Let me make it a little bit smaller so that you can see the y axis also. So that is your x and that is your y axis and you can see that it is pointing in the x direction. This is your hybrid orbital phi 1. Then if you look at the, the hybrid orbital phi 2, well this is not phi 2 but this is the hybrid orbital phi 3 in our notation. So in which direction is it pointing? You can see that it is actually pointing in a, in a downward direction such that the angle with the positive x axis is how much? 120 degrees. These are contour plots. What do contour plots mean? I, I can just remind you. These lines are drawn in such a fashion that along these contours, the value of the wave function is actually 0 0.02. For this one, this line for example has a value of the wave function 0 0.04. You can see that in these directions the function is actually positive or at these points the function is positive while the, in the, along these contours the function has a negative value and obviously there is a contour. This is that contour where the function has the value 0. So this it has a node and this is the third. Now this is the second hybrid orbital which we have called phi 2. 
and again you can see that it makes an angle of 120 with the x direction. So, you have three equivalent hybrids uh, pointing towards the corners of an equilateral triangle. Now, the last case that we will discuss in the case of hybridization is sp3 hybridization. Incidentally, I forgot to mention this particular word because you are actually mixing one s orbital and two p orbitals, you refer to this as sp2 hybridization. And the hybridization in which you mix only one s with a one p that is referred to as sp hybridization. And now we will discuss the case of CH4. CH4 actually is experimentally found to be a tetrahedral molecule. So, so let me draw a tetrahedron. And what the molecule has is actually hydrogen atoms, four of them sitting at the corners of, of a regular tetrahedron with the carbon atom occupying the center of the tetrahedron. So, the carbon hydrogen bonds are represented by these lines and all the bonds are equivalent, they have the same bond length. And uh, how does one explain the structure of this molecule? Well, the electronic configuration of carbon is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, 2. and in order to explain the formation of this molecule, what one imagines is that one electron is promoted from 2s to 2p. So, that you have an S and P x, P y and P z orbitals, these orbitals available for bond formation and the way you have to imagine is that these four orbitals hybridize together to give you four equivalent hybrid orbitals, which we will denote by the symbols phi 1, phi 2, phi 3 and phi 4. So, in this case it is fairly straightforward, you see the, the only conditions that the orbitals have to satisfy is that uh, they have to be normalized, each one of them has to be normalized and each one has to be orthogonal to one another and of course, uh, they all have to be equivalent to one another. So, actually in the, the case in the case of phi 1, it is fairly easy to write an expression for phi 1 and also for the other things, I will not actually derive it, but uh, this is one possible way in which you can construct hybrid orbitals. And that is to say that okay, you will take S, add to it P x, P y and P z. And of course, the result has to be normalized. You can easily calculate the normalization factor, very simple actually, very simple calculation. If you calculated it, you will find that the answer is 1 by 2. And again, think of the way in which this orbital is to be, is going to be oriented in space. See, if this is my coordinate system, the P is that has its positive low pointing in this direction the positive lobe, I am only showing the positive lobe that is for p z, for p x the positive lobe is in this direction and for p y the positive lobe is in that direction, this is x, y and z. So, if you added these things together, you can imagine that the result will be an orbital in which the positive lobe of, of that orbital will make equal angles with x, y and z. So, therefore, if I may put the chalk here, it will be making some such angle, which is this angle will be the same as that angle, which will be the same as that angle. And therefore, you will get a hybrid orbital, which is actually making the same angle with x, y and z. Okay. You, in a similar fashion, I can also find out phi 2, what will it be? 
well I can write it as S, it is actually very easy as I said if I put S plus P X minus P Y minus P Z. Normalization factor is just the same, it is 1 by 2 and why do you have two negative signs? Well, it is very clear why you should have two negative signs because this and that has to be, these two have to be orthogonal. So, if you multiplied this with that and integrated over the entire space, you see S into S you will get uh, that will give, that will be S square, when you integrate over all space you will get unity, this into that will also give you unity. While, while this into that will give you minus 1, this will also give you minus 1. So, you would have 2 minus 1s and 2 plus 1s and therefore, the net result will be 0. And similarly, if you think of phi 3, you would have 1 by 2, very simple to construct, it is going, it will be S minus P x uh, minus P y plus P z and the last one will be 1 by 2 s minus p x plus p y minus p z. And in fact, it is actually possible to make uh, nice pictures of this using Mathematica, but we will not do that. I shall simply show you the way these orbitals are oriented in the next slide. Okay. I told you that, uh, well this is, this particular direction is the direction in which my, uh, my hybrid orbital phi 1 points and then these are the other directions, right. And I have shown with these arrows are the other directions in which the other orbitals are pointing. And it is also obvious that from the figure that they are pointing towards the alternate corners of a regular cube, right. What is shown here is a regular cube, this is one corner or one vertex and this is the next one. So, if the first one is pointing in this direction, the second one does not point in that direction, but to the other corner, that is why I said alternate corners. And using this information, it is possible for you to calculate the angle between these hybrid orbitals. You will find that this is the tetrahedral angle 109 degrees 28 minutes, perfect tetrahedral angle. And therefore, you see that these orbitals are all equivalent, they are actually pointing in equally good directions in space. And this completely explains the formation of tetrahedral CH4 molecule. Fine. Now, this actually concludes my discussion of hybridization and we will now discuss another very interesting topic, which is the subject of Huckel molecular orbital theory. Huckel molecular orbital theory. Remember when I discussed the particle in a box problem, I said that this is a model for a conjugated system. So, particle confined to a box, you can say that well, uh, this will form a molecule, form a model for a conjugated systems. So, here is a somewhat better model for conjugated systems. So, if you think of a conjugated system like 1, 3 butadiene, the molecule will be CH2 Well, at this point, I will have to depend upon your previous knowledge. I will remind you that each one of these carbons is sp2 hybridized and this will leave a p orbital perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. 
So each one of them is sp2 hybridized, okay. And the sp2 hybrid orbitals are used to form three bonds. For example, if you think of this carbon, it is sp2 hybridized. It it forms bonds with these two hydrogens, so that is two bonds, and then it forms a bond with the carbon, a sigma bond. Usually, that is the the, the description. Similarly, this carbon it forms one sigma bond with this carbon, one sigma bond with the other carbon, and one sigma bond with the other hydrogen. So all of them are sp2 hybridized, and they are all the sigma hybrids, all the hybrid orbitals are used to form sigma bonds. So that actually leaves a p orbit. Let me remove these double bonds. This is the what is referred to as the sigma framework of the molecule. I can even make it better by saying that okay. Uh, uh, I have a system like this. Okay, that is the correct geometry of the molecule, roughly. So these are actually the sigma bonds formed by the hybrid orbitals, but this actually leaves a unhybridized p orbital perpendicular the, here the assumption is that the molecule is in the plane of the board so therefore the unhybridized p orbital will be perpendicular to the plane of the board so there is one here there is one on that carbon sitting like that uh, on one on this and a fourth on this and this orbitals these p orbitals are parallel to one another so they will overlap and they will form bonds okay so the Huckel theory was formulated by Huckel long ago to describe only the unhybridized p orbitals, how they combine together to form, uh, right? What are referred to as pi bonds. Or, or they form what is referred to as the pi system of the molecule, and this theory describes only the pi system of the molecule. Now we will not be drawing pictures like this, but what I will do is I will say, okay, I have uh, four carbons. You know, you are all you are chemists, so you know that there are hydrogens and so on. All that is of interest to me is these p orbitals, which are perpendicular. They are all parallel to one another. They are all perpendicular to the plane of the molecule. And these p orbitals, I need a notation. So what I will do is, I will call this chi one. This is on the first carbon. This I will call chi two. It is on the second carbon. This is chi three and chi four. Now it is usual to have conjugated systems, which can be quite long. And if you had ten atoms, what will happen? You will have chi one, chi two, chi three, chi four, etc., until chi ten. And now in our molecular orbital description, what would what we would do is we would have a combination like C1 chi1 plus C2 chi2 plus C3 chi4 plus C4 chi4. We will say that molecular orbitals are obtained. They have the form C1 chi1 plus C2 chi2 plus C3 chi3 plus C4 chi4, and then. Uh, what should I do? I will have to do a variational calculation. How will I do the variational calculation? I would uh, write an expression for script E. I will assume that my molecular orbitals are given by this, then use this in a variational calculation. In the variational calculation, script E is now going to depend upon not two parameters, but four parameters. So, therefore, you would have E being a function of C1, C2, etc., until C4. If you have 10 orbitals, it's, it will be a function of uh, 10 coefficients. The next step will be you will put dou E by dou C1 equal to 0. Similarly, you will put dou E by dou C2, dou E by dou C3, dou E by dou four C4 equal to 0. What will you get? You will get four equations in this case. If you have 10 coefficients, then you will get 10 equations. And they can these equations can be written just as we did earlier. They can be written in a matrix form. The way we wrote this matrix equation, I hope you still remember. 
in that case we had only really a 2 by 2 matrix that is because we had only really two atomic orbitals combining but now you have four atomic orbitals combining so naturally the equation the matrix equation that one has will involve uh, the c1 c2 c3 c4 these are the contributions of these atomic orbitals to the molecular orbital phi and what will be the nature of this matrix well we can write by looking at the previous things that we have done it is the first element here is going to be h11 earlier you had hia that is because you were calling the orbitals 1s a and 1s b but now you have h11 what is h11 let me just remind you h11 will be defined to be integral of chi 1 star h chi 1 d 2 right so you would have h11 minus script e then what will be the next element it is going to be h12 minus script e s12 what is h12 it is a quite simple integral chi 1 star h chi 2 d 2 that will be h12 and s12 will be integral chi 1 star chi 2 d 2 this is by analogy with the case of h2 plus we can write this so the next element will be h13 i am running out of space here so maybe i should write smaller this will be my first row right this first row into that should of course give me the answer 0 that is my first equation this equation will be obtained if you differentiated script e with respect to c1 and put the derivative equal to 0 similarly if you differentiated with respect to c2 and put the derivative equal to 0 the answer that you are going to get is s21 minus e s21 h 2 2 minus script e h 2 3 minus script e well this is tedious i probably should have taken a smaller molecule as the example so that i mean i didn't have to write so many but it is not difficult let me just continue to write this is all that is going to happen and the definitions of these numbers h11 h12 h13 h14 and so on they are all similar to what i have defined here so this is what huckel did he wrote this equation and then he said okay let us make this equation as it stands is very difficult to handle so let us make some simplifications and physically motivated simplifications if you think of s14 what is s14 s14 actually involves multiplying chi 1 with chi 4 right i should say chi 1 star but it does not matter chi 1 is real so you multiply chi 1 with chi 4 now chi 1 so it is actually an overlap integral involving chi 1 and chi 4 and these atoms are far away correct so therefore what would you expect s 1 4 i would expect it to be very close to 0 very very small and not only really s14 even h14 right because the, at the the atoms are far away because the uh, atomic orbitals chi1 and chi4 are far away i would expect that this also will be zero so therefore what will i do definitely h14 and s14 both are zero so therefore 
very close to 0, so I will replace it with 0. This makes things easier. H what about H13? They also are far away. They are not very close. So I will say that this is 0. Now H12, H12 is actually on neighboring, it involves neighboring atoms. And therefore, what would I expect? I would expect that the value of H12 is not small. Value of S12 also, it is not that small. Actually, if you evaluate it, if you can evaluate it roughly, you will find that it has an answer of 0 0.25. But Huckel did not want to consider even that because he wanted to have a very simple theory. So he said we will, we will neglect this S12, which means that all the overlap integrals that occur in this expression, I am going to say they are all 0. And the matrix, the, the, the elements of this matrix, like H12, because 1 and 2 are, are on neighboring carbon atoms, I am not going to neglect it. Okay. So, if I did the same kind of thing here, S24, they are not on neighbor, so this is going to be 0. S24 also is 0, but H23 definitely is not 0. S23, I will approximate it as 0, because 2 and 3 are neighboring. Then coming to here H21, you look at this H21, it involves orbitals 2 and 1, so this is non zero. S21 I will neglect. H31 involving carbon atoms 1 and 3, this is 0, that also is 0. H32 is not 0, this I will put it equal to 0, this is neglected, and this is 0 that is 0, uh, this I will neglect, right. And everywhere else I have, everywhere that I have rubbed off things, I put 0. This 0 better that it is written here. So that is a simplifying assumption. Now we will make further simplifications. See what is H12? H12 is actually the interaction between chi1 and chi2. It represents interaction between the reson what is known as the resonance integral. H12 is referred to as a resonance integral and it represents the interaction between chi1 and chi2. And similarly, H23 it represents the interaction between chi2 and chi3. Now, we, I would expect that they are roughly equal, they do not have to be exactly equal because the carbon atoms are not equivalent, but I will make the approximation that the interaction between this and that is the same as the interaction between this and that. That actually means that H12 is assumed to be equal to H23, which again I will assume is equal to H34, and so I am assuming that all these elements H12, H23, H34, they are all equal and their value I am going to denote by the symbol beta. They are all the same. This is another approximation. Then H21, H32, H43 in the same fashion, they are all equal to beta. Okay, they are all equal to beta. Then H11, H22, H33, H44, these are actually energies of the atomic orbitals, chi1, chi2, chi3, these are energies, remember, these are energies of the atomic orbitals, chi1, chi2, chi3, chi4, etc., I will say that they are all equal, right, because they are all atomic orbitals on the carbon atom. So what has happened, my theory has simplified a lot. This is, well, I am making the assumption that H11 is equal to H22, it is equal to H33, which is equal to H44, and that I am going to say they are all equal, I shall denote them by the symbol alpha. So they let us now say, okay, this is alpha. Strictly speaking, this will not be equal to that, it is only approximately true, but I do not worry about that because my theory is very simple and crude. So these are all equal to alpha and these numbers H, they are all equal to beta.
fine. So, this is my new matrix equation after all these simplifications and it looks ni much nicer than the previous expression that I had and if you like you can even make it appear simpler. I will multiply from the left hand side with a 1 by beta. So, what do you mean by multiplying a matrix by 1 by beta? That means you each element you are dividing by beta. So, naturally if you multiply it by 1 by beta this this beta will be converted into a 1. So, all the betas that are there, they will all be converted into unity after this multiplication. So, you have 1 here, you have 1 here, 1, 1 and 1 and here you will have this divided by beta, here this divided by beta and that as well as that. And as you know it is tedious to write alpha minus script T divided by beta. So, what I will do is I will adopt a shorthand notation. I will say that I will use the simple x, x is alpha minus script T divided by beta and therefore, along the diagonals what do I have? I just have this object x. So, therefore, you see you see how simplified the theory is and of course, after all these simplifications you have a very nice looking matrix equation. Let me just remind you x is actually equal to alpha minus script T divided by beta. Beta is referred to as the resonance integral and alpha is referred to usually referred to as the Coulomb integral. These are the traditional words used to denote these integrals. Now, what is our aim? Our aim actually is to find script E, correct? That is our aim essentially. We want to find script E and of course, when you look at the definition of uh, script E, it is clear that sorry, when you look at the definition of x, it is clear that if I am able to determine the value of x, then naturally I will get the value of script E. So, therefore, the, the, this matrix equation you see I have to manipulate and determine the different possible values of script E, which essentially means I have to determine the different possible values of x. Now, if this matrix equation is to have non trivial solutions, what do I mean by that? Well, an obvious solution will be C1, C2, C3, C4 equal to 0 that is referred to as the trivial solution. Now, if this matrix can be inverted, if you can find its inverse then you can multiply from the left hand side with the inverse and you will find that C1, C2, C3, C4 all must be equal to 0 which is not acceptable and therefore, what should happen? The determinant of this matrix should be equal to 0. So, you will write this determinant, I am not going to write to repeat it, but this matrix is going to occur there and you will have to put it equal to 0 and this is a 4 by 4 determinant right and x is occurring only along the diagonals and if you expanded the determinant what is going to happen you will get an equation which involves x to the power of 4 right. If you have this matrix equation and if you uh, said that I am going to evaluate the determinant of the matrix and put it equal to 0 you will get a quartic equation in x and a quartic equation in x how many solutions would you have? You will have 4 solutions and these 4 solutions are the energies of the molecular orbitals, they will determine right. These 4 solutions will give me energies of 4 molecular orbitals, they will give me 4 different values of script E. These are the energies of the 4 molecular orbitals that are formed from these atomic orbitals. We will continue our discussion in the next lecture. Thank you for listening.